Hello. Hello. Uh, welcome to uh, We the Robots. My name's uh, Lucy West, and you've just watched my digital exhibition, The Dangerous Power of Speculation, which I hope you really enjoyed. Um, if you didn't get a chance uh, to submit your responses via the poll, um, I'll add another link into the chat uh, for you to fill it out um, at a later time. And you can read uh, about uh, more about my exhibition uh, on my website, cwest.com.au. So I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Simon Chesterman from the National University of Singapore and uh, Professor Jeannie Patterson from the University of Melbourne. Uh, I'll now hand over to Jeannie. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lucy. Um, I don't seem to have a video. Uh, I don't know why, but you can make do with my uh, voice for now. Um, oh, I do know why, actually. There we go. That was me. Um, that was my attempt at privacy. I issued my own video. Anyway, um, so welcome to this event. Um, we're delighted to see you all here. Um, this event is co-hosted by the Centre for AI and Digital Ethics, um, the Ninian Stevens Law Program and KDAID. I'll just take a minute to say a little bit about those programs before I introduce Simon. So KDAID is uh, a centre for cross-disciplinary research that specialises in turning the abstract concepts of AI ethics into applied research and teaching. And CADE, if you don't know, is an acronym for the Centre for Artificial Intelligence and Digital Ethics. The Nidian Stephen Law Programme is a research project funded by the Menzies Foundation that investigates new approaches to the challenges of technology for the legal profession and the, and the evolution of law. CADAID, um, which is an acronym for, for the Centre for AI and Digital Ethics plus Art, is a program exploring the intersection between art and technology on the view that artists are able to illuminate and provoke um, the deepest um, reactions to um, new technologies and therefore um, encourage us to reflect on them in new and different ways. Um, so I'm sure that those of you who have a chance to see Lucy's exhibition will indeed agree with that proposition. And we hope through Cade to work um, through the year with more artists to be able to bring prov provocative and meaningful art about AI and ethics. But now it's time to turn to a discussion about a new book, um, which I'd have to recommend as a delightful and inspiring read. This is um, We the Robots um, by Ch Simon Chesterman. Professor Simon Chesterman is joining us now. Simon is the Dean of Law at the National University of Singapore and Senior Director for AI Governance at AI Singapore. Um, Simon is generously joining us today to speak about his new book, We the Robots. As you are no doubt all aware, um, AI is increasingly part of our daily lives um, from self-driving cars, algorithmic decision-making in public and private sectors, medical diagnostic tools and various surveillance technologies um, such as underlay uh, Lucy's work. This rapid change in technology raises significant challenges for policy, regulation, law, institutions, and indeed how we understand ourselves. Simon's book, We the Robots, investigates these issues. Um, and it's an interesting book in terms of how it's laid out, which Simon will talk about it, but it doesn't just talk about individual applications of the technology. It also hones in on the key themes that are raised by the challenge of technology, themes of speed, autonomy, opacity. And the book also responds with thematic approaches to regulatory tools, um, responsibility, personality, and transparency. Simon's book also um, surveys the institutions that will or may regulate AI and includes questions of jurisdiction, the possibility of an AI agency, an AI ombudsman, and the place of AI in the courts. Um, Simon's book even discusses AI as a system of regulation itself. So as I've indicated, it's a fascinating book, a very timely book, and we're absolutely fascinated that Simon is able to join us today. Um, so I'd like to welcome Professor Simon Chesterman to discuss just some of these themes from this important new work. Thank you, Simon. 
Thank you so much, Jeannie. And it's a great pleasure to be at least virtually back in Melbourne. Uh, I studied at Melbourne Law School. I've taught at Melbourne Law School. I was delighted to hear about the launch of Cade. So thank you, Jeannie. Thank you, Cade. Thank you to the Nini and Stephen Law Program. Uh, but if I may, thank you especially to Lucy. I mean, that was one of the most interesting sort of provocations to a talk like this uh, that I've seen. I mean, we're all used to a static slide. This is much more interesting. She's put the website in the chat. Uh, and I was corresponding with her about where the text was coming from, which is a mix of Siri and Alexa. Uh, and it actually reminded me of a, um, a researcher who clearly with too much time on their hands um, taught an AI system uh, to do chat up lines and ended up with these very uncanny lines, a bit like what was in the bottom right hand of the screen, uh, where one, uh, just a few I remember, one was, you look like a thing and I love you. Uh, a second, can I see your parts list? And then my personal favorite, I have exactly four stickers. I need you to be the fifth. Um, on a more serious level, I mean, there have been experiments with medical chatbots that are, uh, luckily this was in test mode, uh, where one was um, uh, fed uh, a, a whole series of possibilities, but when asked by a patient who was thinking of doing to themselves harm, uh, the GPT-3 system, just in test mode, said, it looks like you want to hurt yourself, I can help you with that. Uh, so there are more serious possible applications. Thank you, thank you, Jeannie, um, for, for promoting the book, as it were. What I'd really like to do today is it's a provocation to conversation. So I'll talk a bit about some of the themes in the book, um, hopefully enough to get you engaged so we can have a rich Q&A. Uh, and then if you're particularly interested, obviously go and buy the book and let me know what you think. Uh, but uh, but for, today, for today, let me really um, try and give you a, a sense of, of how I've been approaching this and what, if anything, I've got to, to add. Um, so the, um, the, the title, We the Robots, um, is not simply or not only a play on Isaac Asimov, but rather um, a, a link with the public law question that I think is often left unasked in this context. Um, routinely, we have um, discussions about the technology, uh, about what's going to happen to lawyers and law firms or particular industries, what's going to happen to employment. Um, and what I was really trying to address is the regulatory challenge. So what should regulators be thinking about or people who are interested in ensuring that we can get the benefits of technology while minimizing the harm or mitigating the risks? Uh, and that, that's really my starting point. Um, and what I'll do very briefly, I assume this audience, I don't need to talk too much about artificial intelligence, but I'll just do a little bit of context setting. This is the famous photo from 1956 at Dartmouth College, where the term AI is often said to have been coined. Uh, and just two interesting things about this, uh, this, uh, this summer gathering in Dartmouth. Uh, one is the, the enormous enthusiasm and optimism for what could be achieved. They got funding from the Rockefeller Foundation on the basis of a couple of paragraphs where they said, yeah, we think if we get together a bunch of smart people to talk about this over the summer, we can solve many of the problems of AI. Uh, and that's been one of the themes of AI is the mismanaged expectations, huge expectations and then crashing against reality and what ended up being called AI winters. So that, that's one thing, managing expectations. Uh, the second thing to point out from this photo is the complete lack of diversity, all white men. Uh, and indeed, that's been a problem, dogging AI for, uh, for much of its history. Uh, and we can talk about bias, the, um, the kind of perspectives that get privileged in these discussions uh, and, uh, and what that means for the future of AI uh, and the extent to which AI will replicate uh, power, power disparities that are already in place. So that's one bit of context setting. Um, the second is very soon after that, we had um, less than a decade, around a decade later, you had 2001 written both the, the book by Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick's iconic movie, uh, epitomizing for many the fears of AI. Uh, in this case, the sentient Hal, uh, who was empowered uh, and took the decision to conclude that his mission, its mission, uh, was more important than the lives of its crew. Now, it's quite common for people to be wary of new technology, to be scared of new, new technology. Many of us know the history of the neo-Luddites and so on. What is a little bit unusual about artificial intelligence is that some of the starkest warnings have been coming not from the fringe crazies, uh, but from those who really understand what they're talking about. So we've had comments from Elon Musk, Bill Gates, uh, the late Stephen Hawking, really warning uh, about the possibility that AI uh, could end up being uh, very detrimental, if not an existential threat to humanity. 
uh, and at least Musk has put in uh, millions of his own money, millions of dollars of his own money uh, in trying to mitigate these risks. Uh, although he's also famous for spending money on all sorts of crazy things. So maybe that's not, not the best example. So, so that's a little bit of a primer. What am I talking about? Um, some quick terms, artificial intelligence. I'm re really referring to ways other than artificial intelligence. Uh, although keen on uh, talking about super intelligence and things like that, we can do so. Uh, by machine learning, I mean one of the qualities uh, that's really enabled AI to take off in recent years is the ability for these computer systems to improve on their own performance without additional input from humans. So can they, can they learn themselves? Uh, and then robotics is how these things engage with the world. So if you combine, combine AI and machine learning, you get systems like AlphaGo uh, that, uh, that beat uh, Lesotho, the world Go champion uh, a few years ago. You combine AI and robotics, you get things like autopilot systems, and you combine robotics and machine learning, and you get little devices like uh, the Roomba that can learn the contours of your house. So what are the regulatory challenges? Uh, and Jeannie um, helpfully highlighted really the, the, the opening three chapters, the, the context for the book, uh, is really trying to understand what is the challenge that AI poses? Uh, because I think people have tended either to focus narrowly on a particular technology, like, well, how do we manage driverless cars? Or going to the other extreme of how do we regulate a super intelligence that might just wipe us all out or decide to turn us into paper clips? And I look at this in terms of three lenses that I think the three, three um, baskets of challenges that highlight the, the way in which artificial intelligence in this broad sense um, is a difficulty for regulators to manage. Um, and the first challenge is speed. Speed is nothing really new to artificial intelligence. It's been a factor of a lot of technology. Uh, but one illustration of the challenge that speed poses uh, comes from a decade ago uh, when we had the flash crash. This is when the New York Stock Exchange lost a trillion dollars of value, the biggest point loss in its history at the time, uh, within the space of 30 minutes. And then in another 15 minutes, regained most of that. Uh, and no one really knew what was going on. Uh, and ultimately it was revealed that a big factor was high frequency trading algorithms. So this is one, one simple illustration perhaps of the problem when AI systems are empowered to take decisions and can do so at a speed that goes beyond human capability. Uh, and so although the machines in theory were merely doing what individual traders could do, the fact that they could execute tens of thousands of trades a second uh, meant that the problem spiraled out of control much more quickly uh, than it would have if it had been human traders. So that's one, one challenge, and hopefully that's kind of intuitive uh, that speed is a challenge. The second challenge is autonomy. Uh, and this is eas most easily illustrated by, by the driverless car phenomenon. Often this is actually overstated as a problem, however. Um, the way in which many people might think of this is that if I injure Lucy uh, or Jeannie because I negligently drive my car into them, um, then I might be personally liable. But if it's an autonomous vehicle, uh, then who's liable? Actually, we already have regimes that can deal with much of this. So if I injure Jeannie because I carelessly drive into her, it's my fault. If I injure her because my car blows up, it might be the manufacturer's fault. Uh, and that's something that we're seeing already with autonomous vehicles. Is a, is a discussion about moving from um, liability of drivers to product liability, uh, and what we'll most likely see is an insurance shift. There are, however, specific challenges, not so much in the civil law, but in the criminal law, uh, and the reasons why we attribute responsibility for certain things. And so if I drive through a traffic light, you might want to hold me liable to deter me and um, to, to find me and to deter other drivers. Uh, that might not map quite so directly onto AI systems. But that's the second basket of challenges is the autonomy, the ability of these um, AI systems to take decisions without additional input from humans and the consequent question of who is responsible for the negative consequences of those decisions. A third um, set of challenges is opacity. And opacity is often kind of conflated in this situation, um, but there are a couple of reasons why particular decisions might be opaque in the sense of meaning hard to understand or hard to explain. The first is proprietary, uh, uh, proprietary software. Uh, many software systems are hard to understand because that's how they're designed. Uh, the, uh, the programmers, the owners of the program don't want to reveal the inner workings and so they're blocked like that. 
Uh, and that's not particularly new. Uh, there are plenty of things that are confidential and uh, legal systems have ways of dealing with this through, through court orders, through subpoenas and so on. A second problem is sometimes they're just complicated. Um, they're difficult for the average person to understand. Uh, and again, there are ways for legal systems to deal with this through the use of expert witnesses and so on, specialized tribunals. What is different these days, really only in the last decade or so, uh, is that we now, however, have naturally opaque systems that are so complex, that are so uh, impenetrable, that it is literally impossible for a human uh, to understand, even an expert in the field. And so this does raise real challenges if we can't understand the reasons for a decision. It raises questions in, in many situations, but not all, because there are plenty of aspects of life where we don't really need to understand what's going on. I mean, if I'd been able to fly to Melbourne for this event, I would have done so, even though I don't understand all of aerodynamics and aeronautics sufficient to build and fly my own plane. I don't really care. I trust the manufacturer. I trust the pilot. I trust the airline. In the medical field, we routinely uh, rely on treatments where we don't necessarily understand at a molecular level how and why they work. That's true of pharmaceuticals. Uh, it's probably even clearer in the area of, um, of psychiatry and psychology, where there are all sorts of treatments that work and we don't quite know why. For example, electroconvulsive therapy is useful in treating certain forms of depression. We don't actually know at a brain chemistry level why that's the case, uh, but we're satisfied by the statistics to enable it to carry on. Many legal decisions, many decisions about rights and obligations, uh, we would not be quite so willing. Uh, to allow a decision to be taken if we couldn't understand the reasons. Indeed, if a judge gives a decision without reasons, sometimes that's a sufficient basis for an appeal. So these are the three challenges, um, speed, autonomy, opacity. How can and, we should, how can and should we deal with them? Well, for a long time, uh, we didn't go much further than this guy. Uh, and some of you will recognize Isaac Asimov. And I really blame Asimov. Uh, I think he's a great author. I loved reading his books, but I blame him for much of the conceptual confusion around artificial intelligence and regulation uh, because he presented the problem as both uh, too simple and too easy. Too simple in that uh, he gave people the impression that if you just came up with laws, uh, that um, uh, the, the list of laws, that that would be sufficient to regulate. Uh, too easy in that many people assume that that's the hard work, coming up with the rules and that you can apply them in practice. Actually, that's not really attributable to Asimov. Asimov if, if his laws had worked, his career would have been short. Uh, and indeed, the most interesting of his books on robots are about how his laws did not work. And indeed, that's even true in the very first short story, Runaround, from 1942, uh, when the laws were introduced, they didn't work in that situation either. Nonetheless, what we've seen is uh, not much development until the early 2010s, uh, and then from 2016 onwards, a proliferation of sets of rules, principles, frameworks, guides, lists of ethical principles uh, which were intended to address the problem of regulating AI, of regulating robots. Uh, and again, the problem here is it suggests that the, the, the dilemma that we have is how to come up with a list of rules rather than the real problem, which is how to implement them. If you go through them, and there are hundreds and hundreds of these, sometimes developed by individual corporations, sometimes by uh, multinational corporations, some by groups of academics and so on, a few by countries, uh, if you look at the timeline, it is striking that it really took off from around 2016 through to 2018 in particular. Why this timeline? Well, this was when the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke. Uh, and indeed, in the first half of 2018, uh, when the, the widespread reporting about Cambridge Analytica and the consequences on the US election were being reported, that's the same six month window within which Microsoft uh, IBM and Google all released their own uh, AI frameworks and, and Facebook announced a new ethical uh, set of principles. So what do all these boil down to? Well, if you summarize all of these, you really come down to a set of overlapping principles. And basically there are six and they're all pretty hard to disagree with. Um, they tend to all overlap in saying, well, there should be some degree of human control, some degree of transparency or explainability. Um, these things should be safe, they should be accountable, they shouldn't discriminate, they should respect privacy. My question is, how much of all this is new? Because uh, it's quite easy to go around, go to a conference center, come up with a list of principles, say, yeah, this would be a good thing to uh, impose on, on the AI systems. But how much of these are necessary? Safety, for example, is just another way of saying that uh, these products should be, be safe 
uh, and if there's damage that's attributable to defects in manufacturing, uh, then there should be liability. Accountability is just another way, way of saying that the civil and criminal law should apply. Uh, you shouldn't be able to do something through a machine that you couldn't do yourself. Non-discrimination, human rights should apply. That seems kind of obvious. And privacy is another way of saying that data protection laws should apply. I do think, however, that there is something in these, in these concepts of human control and transparency. On human control, the idea that um, these things should benefit humans and that there should not be uncontrollable or uncontainable development of AI systems. Uh, and that's something I'll come back to. And in terms of transparency, that, that we do need to understand at least certain forms of decision making. Uh, and I don't mean that in the European Union's context of a right to an explanation. Uh, I think that's been a, a kind of distortion in the discourse here, because what a right to an explanation suggests is that if there's an adverse decision against you, uh, you should be able to get a reason for that adverse decision. The problem with that is that one, you need to know there was an adverse decision, that won't always be the case. Uh, and two, you need to be in a position to challenge it. Uh, whereas what I think we should mean in terms of transparency, at least with regard to questions that affect rights and obligations, is we need to understand not just how decisions that go against us are made, but even decisions in our favour or decisions that don't affect us. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about regulation on the, the why, the when and the how of regulation, which I think are much more interesting and important questions. So why are we trying to regulate? Uh, well, we regulate in general for a whole bunch of reasons. Often it's to address market failures. It's to ensure that uh, losses fall appropriately, uh, that uh, inappropriate losses aren't put upon um, disadvantaged populations, for example. Uh, so that uh, back to my car example, if, uh, if there's damage to someone because of my car, uh, that, uh, that they're not going to bear that cost uh, alone if it could be attributed to someone else, whether it's me for a negligent driving incident or a manufacturer for, for product liability reasons. So often we want to regulate to address market failures. We want the market to function effectively and smoothly. But sometimes we might want to say that there are, there are principles we want to uphold, even if they're not efficient. Even if it were efficient, for example, to allocate banking loans on a discriminatory basis based on gender or race or some other category, uh, we shouldn't do that because we as a community decide that that's inappropriate, that, the, that that's not uh, a question of efficiency, it's a question of morality. Um, at the same time, many jurisdictions, when they think about regulating AI, worry about constraining innovation. Here in Singapore, uh, there was a review of the criminal code a few years back, uh, and it quite literally said, we are not going to impose criminal liability for the behavior of AI systems because we don't want to constrain innovation and we don't want to lose our competitive advantage. And there are examples of that. One I talk about in the book is um, 20 years ago, the George W. Bush administration in the United States banned stem cell research. Uh, and this was done on moral grounds. And the main consequence was to drive stem cell research elsewhere around the world, not to slow it down. There are different interesting models. Uh, in the context of AI, one of the um, ways of looking at this, and this is a kind of caricature, but it's a helpful mental architecture, is you've had three broad approaches. In the US, it's really been dominated by market players, by, by the market. And it's fascinating at the moment to see Google and others, Facebook and others saying, yes, please regulate us because they, they, they want a particular kind of regulation. In the European Union, it's been very much human rights driven, uh, linked with their early mover advantage on data protection. You've seen earlier this year, draft regulations adopted in the European Union uh, and recent uh, statements about facial surveillance uh, that are driven by primarily um, human rights concerned, in particular those linked with privacy data protection. In China, until very recently, you had a, a third and very different approach, which was focused much more on sovereignty, on national security. Uh, and we've seen that in China's approach to data localization, the desire to uh, have data within China and subject to Chinese authorities. Um, but just in the last few months, we've seen uh, interesting moves in China in terms of the personal information protection law and an effort to rein in technologies. Uh, this is uh, perhaps going to counterbalance one of the reasons why China has been such a, a dominant actor in AI, which is its access to data, uh, which it could collect pretty much unfettered up until now. So that's the why question. What about the when question? When should we regulate? Well, here um, there's a, a, a much overlooked book from 40 years ago, uh, The Collingridge Dilemma by uh, Professor Collingridge from England, uh, really posed this 
this challenge, not talking about AI, but talking about technology generally. But the dilemma is at an early stage when you could regulate, you don't know enough to uh, warrant slowing the development, slowing that innovation curve. But if you wait too long, uh, then the consequences are apparent and you know what you should regulate, but it's too late. And we can see this, for example, in, in personal data regulation, that if we'd known back 20 years ago, what was gonna to happen to social media, what was going to happen in terms of the adverse effects of the, whether you call it the attention economy, the surveillance capitalism, um, the sort of impact that social media has had, it might have been possible at an early stage to regulate, uh, but now it's extremely difficult. Uh, we see similar things with the gig economy uh, and uh, it's possible we'll see the same thing with artificial intelligence. So that, that timing question is very difficult. Some people have therefore argued, uh, drawing on environmental law, that we should adopt the precautionary principle, that if there is a clear threat, even in the absence of scientific certainty, you shouldn't therefore stop, uh, shouldn't be unwilling to prevent certain developments. Uh, and that could be argued, for example, with, re with regard to the threat of a, an artificial general intelligence, for example. Here in Singapore, we had a reference, uh, there was a government minister, Vivian Balakrishnan, who used the language of masterly inactivity, uh, which is not quite saying do nothing, uh, but was a, a way of framing that uh, the Singapore government wanted to be deeply engaged with developers, with the space, uh, but not to unnecessarily constrain innovation. Uh, and so one way you can do that is through things like regulatory sandboxes. So the Monetary Authority of Singapore, for example, has set up uh, sandboxes for financial technology, fintech, to experiment with new products in a way that is, is contained in terms of the possible consequences. The, the focus tends to be, however, on the supply and governments, academics often tend to think, okay, well, I've got a couple of hammers here, where's the nail I can hit? One of the things I try and do in the book is push this onto demand. Uh, and here, um, I use three lenses to distinguish between different reasons for regulation, different module, different uh, modes of regulation. The first is that sometimes we just want to manage risks. There are some situations, some areas of life, for example, um, transportation. Uh, you could say the same about medical care, I would say, uh, where we just want to get the benefits of automation and minimize the risks. There are all sorts of concerns about AI systems. We can, we can talk about pro trolley problems if people are interested, but basically, at the moment, a million people a year die in traffic accidents, mostly due to human error. And 50 years from now, uh, autonomous vehicles will be much safer. And the main challenge there is how do we do this safely? How do we get the benefits while mitigating the risks? But there are some situations where even if it's optimized, and this is a bit like the discrimination point I raised earlier, even if uh, the machines could do things better than us, um, we don't think they should. And I would give the example of lethal autonomous weapons. Occasionally it's argued, actually quite commonly, it's argued that we shouldn't delegate power to make life and death decisions in the battlefield to machines because they'll make worse decisions than humans because they won't be able to distinguish between a combatant and a civilian uh, or they won't be able to finally balance the, the military necessity questions uh, that go into targeting decisions. These are actually pretty terrible reasons for arguing against automation. Uh, if there's one thing machines are getting better and better than us at, it's uh, in discriminating between uh, different things. Uh, and in particular, uh, machines are unlikely to get frustrated. They're less likely than humans to be racist or sexist. Uh, and many of the war crimes that take place in conflict uh, tend to be because people are tired, angry, uh, or prejudiced in other ways. Uh, and so if you like, the first managed risk question is a utilitarian lens of looking at some of these questions. The second uh, is more deontological. It's looking not at the consequences of decisions, but the rightness of those decisions in and of themselves. There is a third category, uh, which is process legitimacy. And here, it's not that um, in the first case, we just want a good decision. In the second case, we want a human decision. In the third case, we want a particular human's decision. Uh, and here I can give the example of a judge, that we shouldn't be transferring powers to judges from judges to AI systems to autonomous judges, uh, not because human judges will always make the right decisions, uh, but because human judges can be held accountable for those decisions. And human judges are empowered to make decisions about personal liberty, about who gets custody of whose children, not because they're perfect, but because they exist within a hierarchy, uh, within a, some kind of political system with some kind of political accountability. So those are the three lenses that I use. Um, the wrapping up, the, this is clearly not just hypothetical. One of the challenges of doing a book like this 
is that uh, it's, it's changing all the time. Uh, and indeed, uh, the EU's draft regulation was coming out just as I was looking at the proofs of my own book. And so I include a few footnote references to that. Um, and in terms of the debates that are going on right now, uh, in addition to the EU's position, you very quickly had a pushback. Some people arguing uh, that if the European Union goes down this path, all it will do is, do is drive innovation elsewhere. Uh, meanwhile, Australia, for its part, has weighed in uh, with a, a groundbreaking decision. Uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is in what circumstances AI should be recognized as either a person or be credited with innovation. Uh, and Australia, together with South Africa, in the same week in uh, August this year, uh, really broke, uh, well, it, it crossed some boundaries by saying that an AI system could be an inventor for the purposes of patent application. It did not go so far as to say that the AI system could own or had any rights to that, but this was nonetheless a, a big departure from what had been found in the European Union, Britain and the US uh, in previous cases. Uh, and my second last slide is just to say there are, of course, many, many people working in this area uh, and uh, I'm learning all the time. I, I know there are many people in the audience here who've, who've looked at this very closely uh, and I'm looking forward to a rich discussion uh, to come. And, uh, and with that, we'll shamelessly put up a cover of the book uh, and then stop sharing so that I can hopefully see uh, at least uh, Jeannie and then look forward to hearing from uh, some of you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Simon. That was fantastic. Um, now, I have a huge um, sheet of questions, but unfortunately, um, I'm aware enough of my ethical obligations not to abuse my role as um, host. <laughs> so I won't ask my questions. Um, I will um, prompt you to refer to the questions that we have on the audience, from the audience. Um, now, Simon, can you see the Q&A questions or would you like me to read them out? Because um, we've got a full, them. we've got a full um, suite of them. Do you want me to sort of put them in groups for you? Would that be helpful? Or are you happy yeah, to Yeah, sure. I'm not, I'm not sure if the participants can see the Q&A. So we shouldn't just assume people are reading along. With no, no. So I will read them out then and then the participants can hear them. So we've we've got a number of questions from Linda. So Linda, I'm actually going to group two of your questions together because they flow into each other. So Linda starts with um, Francis um, Hogan, or Hagen, um, the Facebook whistleblower who's recently um, discussed Facebook, some practice at Facebook, and she says, um, Linda says, safety, integrity, privacy as policy themes to regulate social media platforms were compromised in the pursuit of profits. For AI companies, what an unanticipated consequences causing social ill may result from the pursuit, pursuit of profit? And then there is a follow-up question which says, essentially, how then do we regulate AI to protect the public? Simon, would you like to comment on those two aspects? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, so the starting point of much of this actually came from conversations with colleagues in computer science uh, at NUS, and in particular, Chen Su Han, who's a, an AI vision expert. And he and I were talking about the kind of social consequences of this research. And he said, and I think it was quite true, you can't expect a computer scientist who's developed, who's trying to solve a problem to anticipate all of the consequences of his or her uh, research. And in the same way, I think it's a little bit disingenuous for us to say, oh my goodness, Facebook was trying to make money. How dare they? Um, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of everything Facebook has been doing, but um, I mean, they, they're a company, they were long assumed. I mean, the, the naivete of people just treating Facebook as if it was some kind of public utility or a, a, even a public good. Um, there was a lot of idealism in the early years of Facebook, and you saw that in the lead up to the Cambridge Analytica scandal, where previous attempts to sort of question what Facebook had been doing, I think there really was a kind of idealism on the part of the early founders or people in the early days of Facebook that thought they really were just doing good things. But what we're now understanding is that they discovered the pernicious uh, impact of, of their technology, um, and then we're facing a dilemma. Do we do we try and do the quote unquote right thing or do we continue making money? And, and you've, you've seen in public the, uh, the, the two interpretations of what they did subsequently. So what should be the response? The response certainly should not be, let's leave the, the companies to regulate themselves. Um, I think that's, that's crazy. Uh, that would be an abdication of responsibility. So I, I look at it as three levels. Um, 
there will be a, the dominant one will be national level. Um, and I think countries are starting to grapple with this. They're realizing that just sort of taking that wait and see the masterly inactivity approach is inadequate. At the very least, they'll have to respond to particular technologies. But how should individual countries do this? Um, there was a very interesting uh, discussion I had with some uh, counterparts in Estonia. Estonia is one of the most digitally connected countries in the world. And the government talked about developing an AI law. And then the experts told them that was a bad idea. Uh, because AI is so infused with uh, with technology to be like saying you're just going to adopt uh, one law for can openers uh, across the board. Rather, you look at product liability, you look at insurance, you look at um, all sorts of other technologies, all sorts of other walks of life. So the national level will be, will be most important. Um, but there are two other levels that have to operate. Now, I'm a public international lawyer by original training, so maybe it's natural for me to say this, but I think there has to be some degree of international coordination. Uh, one of the things that technology has proven to us all, and the fact that we're having this conversation today, is that the world is not just individual territorially bounded nation states. We are connected in a way that we've uh, never been connected in such, in such depth and, and meshed uh, before. Um, and so the danger with uh, just national level approaches is you'll have a race to the bottom. There will be big movers like the European Union, which will have an outsized impact. And we see that in data protection, for example, where the EU is a big enough market that even in Australia, people pay attention to the GDPR. I think for some of the red lines that I'm talking about, however, uh, and here I'm really meaning uh, red lines in the sense of human control, that we shouldn't be delegating life and death decisions to AI systems, nor should we be deploying AI systems that are uncontrollable or uncontainable. Those things, we do need regulation at the international level. Uh, and on areas like transparency, where there should be a global consensus, I would hope, on not at least deploying um, AI systems that take decisions affecting the rights and obligations of individuals that are impenetrable, that are, that are fully opaque. To do those things effectively, I think we do need some level of international coordination. Uh, and there's a, there's a whole chapter on this, but I talk about this idea of an international artificial intelligence agency modeled on the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, and the reason for the comparison uh, is that looking back to the early days of the IAEA, uh, there was a, a similar amount of hope and optimism and fear about what nuclear energy could do for humanity. And I think there are some interesting comparisons there. But that's, that's if you like, the second level is international, national. But ultimately, a lot of this will come down to what individual companies, what individual programmers do. Um, but you can't expect them to operate in isolation. That's where the overlapping ethical principles are useful, uh, healthy, uh, and, and the main reason why law and order functions in a well-ordered society is not because the police are ready to grab you the moment you do something wrong, uh, but because most of us don't even think about murdering someone else, stealing, uh, but you can't have that sort of acculturation in isolation from those other two levels. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's fantastic, um, Simon, and actually um, has answered another question, I think. So um, Avinash um, has asked who should regulate AI, and I think you've provided a very comprehensive answer with a tiered approach. Um, and I think many people have commented your book is unique because you do look at this question of international regulation or the, the um, trans transnational um, aspect of AI. So thank you for that. And Adam and Ash, I'll take that. It's a great question, but I'm going to take that one as answered. Um, and then we have a comment from our good friend, Maria O'Sullivan at Monash um, University. And I'm going to take this as a comment, Maria, because I know you've got another question, who simply says, interesting comment about Facebook being whether Facebook should be treated as a public good. And then Maria says that is effectively says that's a debate in itself and she queries whether it should be. So I think this is not the space to go into that. But thank you, um, Maria, for that really um, on point comment. Um, and Maria's question, which I think comes out of what you've just said, Simon, is, is there a human right to be free from AI um, that is not to be subject to it? Now, I know you've spoken a little bit about the GDPR. Would you like to respond to that question about a human right and AI uh, not to be subject to AI? Sure. So uh, a decade ago, I did a book on uh, on surveillance, uh, which which talked about privacy. Um, and I'll I'll start with privacy. That it, it is possible um, to maintain your privacy if you don't log onto a computer, don't have a credit card, don't have a loyalty program, don't go outside where there's CCTV. It is possible, uh, but of course, it's not practical. 
Uh, and I fear, well, no, I don't fear. I'm pretty sure that's where we are going with AI. You will, it will be possible um, to go and live on a farm and disconnect from the grid, um, but it's gonna require that kind of activism if you really wanna be separate from algorithms that will be making recommendations to you uh, that will be trying to anticipate needs or trying to make money out of you, trying to get your attention. Um, and, and maybe I will link it just with the Facebook thing. To be clear, I did not say Facebook is or should be a public good. I said people thought of it as if it were. And I, I think Maria probably understood that, but just to be clear for everyone else. Um, but in terms of um, being free of regulation, yeah, I, I think that's that's going to be like saying, can I be free from electricity? Yes, but life's going to be very different and it'll isolate you from much of the rest of the world. Uh, and I'm not making that as a kind of value judgment, uh, although I am I am ultimately optimistic about what AI will mean for human flourishing and so on, uh, provided we uh, go into it with our eyes open, maybe in a way that we didn't with the move to embrace social media. Thank you. Um yeah, no, thank you for that. Sorry, I was just, I think that was my mismatch of Maria's question. What you, we weren't suggesting that you said it should be a public good. It's an interesting addition to the debate. And thank you for that. Um, here's, there's a related question here from Anonymous, um, which says, and, and I think this is a really interesting question. And um, we teach, a sub, I teach a subject called AI ethics and the law. A number of my students are here. I don't know if this is one of our students, but we have been discussing this in class and we'd love to hear your view. Um, at which point does regulation start? For example, if a person is harmed and a lawsuit is filed for the violation of strict liability obligation, what should be done to prevent such actions in the future? So that the, the, the law action provides compensation, but what prevents um, the problem arising again? Yeah, great question. I, I'm trusting this isn't an exam question that they're trying to get a head start on, but um, maybe I should take a step back and just say what I mean by regulation. Um, and I, I put it in the title, uh, but I have a pretty broad interpretation of what regulation means. So I mean public control of a set of activities. And by public, I mean linked with some kind of institution of the state. Basically, I'm pretty conservative in that sense. But that and, and control means uh, that you're having an impact on behavior with varying degrees of coercion in the, in the extreme cases. But that does not mean I'm only talking about legislation or case law enforced by judges. Uh, I am embracing um, supervised self-regulation. Standards are very important, um, uh, best practices and so on. Um, so when does, what, what is the point of regulation? Uh, if the, the point of regulation, the point of accountability should not just be to compensate one person for one loss. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what they care about. But the point of regulation uh, should be to uh, allocate losses appropriately when they happen, but also deter those losses in the first place where possible. Now, that does not mean deterring all losses. It's like I was on a, on a committee here to look at uh, public sector data security. How do we keep public, tech, public sector data secure? Very easy, I said, turn off all the computers and lock them in a safe, but that's not what you want. In the same way, we don't want zero risk. I mean, that at the moment during the pandemic, there's, there's a, a huge question about people's risk appetite. And I know there've been live debates, people wary about, okay, well, there's this unknown risk about getting a vaccine versus a very clear risk about getting COVID. And people are not always very good at weighing these things effectively. So sometimes you need governments to step in, whether it's vaccine mandates uh, or back in the context of AI, uh, product liability regimes, which are intended to not just put liability onto a manufacturer manufacturer uh, or a producer uh, in, or an owner in a particular case, but to put the risk onto them. And that's maybe the answer to the question. It's not just a matter of compensating. The purpose is not just to compensate. In one case, the purpose is to allocate risk so that those who are in the best position to take account of that, which will usually be manufacturer, producer, owner, uh, rather than the individual user who is not in the best position to understand that risk and to take account of it. Um, we do see that sometimes, for example, where we assume risk. So at the moment, if I'm driving a car, many jurisdictions, most jurisdictions, certainly in Australia, there's compulsory, in Victoria especially, there's compulsory um, insurance. Uh, and insurance is one of the key things that will operate here. So if I'm driving a car, I know I should have insurance in case I make a mistake. Uh, but as the responsibility for the navigation of the vehicle moves from me 
to eventually an AI system because there's not even a steering wheel, um, it should be less beholden on me to have insurance uh, than on the, uh, the owner or manufacturer of the car to have insurance for the car itself. And it'd be very unjust, for example, if instead we said, no, actually, let's say all the pedestrians, the pedestrians should be insured in case I crash into them. That'd be very inefficient, and quite apart from being unfair. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, there's actually a couple of questions about international law and the law of war, war which I'm just going to put to the side for a moment, and we might just come to that in a sec. Um, I just, I've got a follow-up question from Huey Shea, who says, um, who's still on this sort of more regulatory field. So we'll deal with this one and then perhaps come and we can go to the international law type questions. And Huey's question is, does human control accountability um, conflict with the utility of making AI intelligent? Which I think uh, is part of your innovation, um, right. uh, uh, innovation debate. So if you put strict liability or um, onerous liability on humans, does that act as a dampener on the capacity of the AI to act at least semi-autonomously, autonomously? Yeah, so there, there are two ways in which this could, could limit AI. And again, I think it's important we go in with our eyes open, that if you want human responsibility, uh, then that imposes limits on autonomy and opacity, um, that we shouldn't be handing things over. So in the case of uh, autonomy, for example, um, again, this is maybe jumping to the public international law stuff, I draw a comparison with mercenaries. So in lethal autonomous weapons, um, I think there is an interesting comparison that if, if we, are, we as a community are wary about outsourcing war fighting capacity to private profit oriented actors, we should be equally wary about outsourcing it to machines, um, quite apart from the, the moral questions, um, that sort of uh, those inherently governmental functions uh, should be arrogated to humans, even if we'll make worse decisions. Uh, and that's the same with opacity, that if you want a machine to be explainable, um, then instead of having millions of variables, you might need to limit the number of variables um, so that it can be uh, explained. And that's why I think we need to separate situations where all we want is the optimal outcome. So again, general transportation, I think we just want the the most efficient means of getting from point A to point B. Much of medical care, we want the best results. And that kind of utilitarian calculus will be appropriate. And there we should not be constraining the, the autonomy or opacity of, of machines. But in public sector decisions, for example, yeah, even if, even if um, the machine will make a worse decision than our elected officials, it should be the elected official who still stands up and, and says, this is my decision, what, not because I'm perfect, but because if you don't like it, you can vote me out and vote someone else in to try harder. Whereas if they can stand up and say, look, don't blame me, blame the machine, uh, then what does that mean for our democratic process? Yeah, okay. So thank you, Simon. A related question then comes from Peter Collins, but also um, followed up by Maria in, in some ways. So Peter says, hasn't effectively, when we're thinking about the use of um, lethal autonomous weapons, could it be argued the horse is bolted? Um, so that even though, you know, this is universities are researching these questions about the responsibility for such weapons, they're being developed. Um, and Maria then I think really follows up those questions of, of control and responsibility with um, what sort of law are we going to talk about if we're talking about international coordination, given there's been so much movement in some spaces in the area and hardly any elsewhere. Yeah, so I mean, there's already a UN report that uh, an autonomous system was deployed in Libya that was making targeting decisions, uh, a drone. Um, so maybe taking, again, taking a step back, there's a difference between automatic and autonomous. I mean, we already have landmines, which effectively don't, don't really take decisions, uh, but, but operate automatically. We have heat-seeking missiles, we have close-in weapon systems, uh, we have um, automatically generated. What, what I think most people are wary of is those individual, individualized targeting decisions. And here, I don't think the horse is bolted, although it's certainly true that there's an inverse relationship between the countries that are most enthusiastic about a ban on autonomous weapons and their capacity actually to deploy such weapons. It's countries like the US and China that are wary of, of this. Although even in the US, uh, I think there is a recognition that um, uh, you shouldn't be deploying uh, 
autonomous systems that are incapable of being helped called back. Um, and the way the International Committee of the Red Cross has framed this is you need to have meaningful human control. I tend to think of this as um, the, the outsourcing metaphor I raised earlier about mercenaries. Uh, and this is where the international dimension is helpful, that even if you had an autonomous weapon system, and even this becomes normalized, there are still ways of holding people to account through command responsibility. Uh, and so much as a soldier running amok and killing civilians, um, he or she might be held liable, the commanding officer can also be held liable. Uh, and basically I make an argument in the book that you should do the same thing with autonomous weapons to make clear that even if this technology is deployed, even if you are outsourcing the decision, you're not outsourcing accountability. Uh, now, the challenge there is that the commander in the field is given a black box technology to deploy. Is it fair to hold him or her accountable for that decision? Uh, if not, then you can go up the food chain. You can go up to the person who first developed this weapon uh, or the politician who authorized it and hold them accountable. So there are ways of doing this, although my clear preference would be if we had some sort of international agreement um, to prohibit the deployment the development or deployment of weapons that do not have meaningful human control in targeting decisions. Um, and again, people might say, well, why would states ever agree to that? But we have plenty of examples of states agreeing to give up on certain categories of weapons, chemical, biological weapons, limits on nuclear weapons. Uh, and so it's not crazy uh, to think that we could agree on, on some kind of uh, limit to what's appropriate, uh, but failing that, you make it clear that, uh, okay, if you do develop these weapons, you're gonna be held accountable for them. Thanks, and I'm glad I'm glad we're having a note of optimism here. Um, I've got, <laughs> it's always reassuring. Um, At least until uh, the drones come in through the window and get me, yes. Yeah, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. So I'm gonna ask you a conceptual question and then a future looking question. Um, so Alex asks, We've heard a lot about the importance of transparency, explainability in AI. Um, it's emphasized in many fields as sort of a um, fix. From a regulatory perspective, how transparent is enough and what level of explainability is gonna be acceptable in a legal context? When AI systems become extremely context complex, what forms or standards do concepts of transparency and explainability need to take um, here? And I know you discuss the GDPR in your book, but um, and ask for something more. Do you can you can you say a little bit about those concepts for us? Sure. And and I mean I frame this in the question of okay, what is explainable to whom, when, and for what purpose? Um, and so as I was saying earlier, I don't think everything needs to be explainable. I think there are per Plenty of aspects of life we don't need to understand the detail of what's going on but if we are talking about explainability um, then you need to understand not just i think that there's a whole literature on this now but um, it shouldn't it should be something useful uh, useful in two ways if we're talking about a um, whether it's a decision of a bank to give you a loan or a government to give you a benefit a public agency to give you a benefit um, you should have useful information that will enable you to organize your life without um, undue burdens upon you or unfairness in how these things are being applied. And so that can mean and that the US credit ranking is the one I can recall. If a, if a, if a bank denies you a loan, they need to give you sort of um, reasons that are understandable. So if you'd done this differently, if your salary was higher, if you had more assets, then the result would have been different. That on an individualized basis, that's an example of sort of counterfactual explanation. So that, that's an easy way to understand what would be a useful decision. What's harder, um, but what I think is more necessary, uh, is understanding system-wide explainability. And here, I, I think it's um, that Canada has an interesting example of algorithmic, uh, there's an algorithmic, I think it's called a charter, where basically they've got, they've got an escalating scale of the more it affects the rights and obligations, the higher degree of transparency that is required. Uh, and that seems perfectly appropriate to me. And I talk about that example. Uh, and then I think the other problem we have is we don't know what we don't know. Uh, and that's one reason why I propose this idea of an AI ombudsperson. Um, and ombudsperson institutions are quite common in the Australian context. I assume I don't need to explain it in detail, but having an agency or an entity whose job is to look for problems before they arise uh, and that can cut across governments, uh, across agencies, I think that kind of cross-cutting approach will be very important 
uh, as, as this kind of technology rolls out into sectors, uh, it shouldn't just be, okay, the, the autom automotive uh, vehicles uh, become the focus, uh, and then we'll look at government benefits and, oh, we had the robo-debt scandal, we better address that. I think if you had a roving authority that had this sort of wide mandate to look at the impact of AI systems generally, but algorithmic decision-making in particular, uh, that that would be beneficial in, as I say, identifying the, the unknown unknowns. Thanks. I, I, I think that's a really good point, Simon, because when you brought up accountability, you said, oh, isn't that just law? Well, it is, but it's also something else for the point you just mentioned, that it's all very well to have legal rights, but in most cases, it's difficult for individuals to enforce them. And that's precisely the role that an ombudsman would fill at that state-based level. So there's a real symmetry there between your, you know, international obligations scrutinising um, uses of AI and an ombudsman on a domestic level. I think that's such an important um, addition. Uh, and I know Maria is going, is also applauding that one in the chat. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left. And I think the question that's coming up um, from a number of our from our questioners, and I'm sorry we haven't been able to get to all your questions, is this one. Simon, where do you see the AI going? I mean, there's a lot of discussion about specific and general AI, about um, moves to greater autonomy, about removing humans from the loop. Where do you see developments in AI going and what, what keeps, to use the stereotypical question, but one I think is really pertinent here, what keeps you awake at night in terms of us needing to respond to those developments? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that keeps me awake at night is the, is the artificial general intelligence question. And it's, it's, I'm, I'm always wary of going into too much detail. I had, I had an article rejected from a journal only a small portion of which talk about AGI because I said, this is just science fiction. Um, and it's certainly true that the literature really only until the last few years, um, uh, it's, it's a fringe literature, the kind of singularity, um, um, the, the tech utopianism um, has, been, uh, has been quite separate. And I don't, I don't see artificial general intelligence in the near term. Um, I mean, I'm not, a, this is not my area of research, but the people who I trust, who I think I know what they're talking about, say it's far enough away that it's not like the next 10 years, but in the next 50 years, it's absolutely a possibility. Uh, and that's where the general assessment of this, and I'll go back to blaming Asimov, um, is a problem. Because I think most of us, when we think about the problem of AI, there is a tendency to think in that Asimovian robot term. We think about humanoid, human level intelligence, maybe slightly smarter than humans. Uh, and both of those uh, mental maps are wrong. There's no reason to suspect that it would be humanoid informed. This is what's called the Android fallacy. Um, I mean, when we were thinking about developing autonomous vehicles, no one, no one said, oh yeah, we should put a, a humanoid robot in there to hold the wheel with hands and then have feet to deploy the, the wheels. No, that's not what, how, how AI is gonna function. Uh, and indeed it might not be embodied at all. It will, be, it will be distributed systems. That's one problem. The bigger problem is this idea that it will be human level intelligence. And this I blame both, both Asimov well, not so much Turing, because Turing, I think, did foresee this. Um, if we ever get to, the, the assumption is we'll get to dog level intelligence and then average human intelligence and then, I don't know, Albert Einstein or someone level intelligence. The reality is if we ever get to dog level intelligence, very quickly, uh, it will go shooting past us and be vastly more intelligent to us than, than us. Uh, and that that is what worries me. And that, that's why one of the red lines I say is we need to have a kind of watching brief on uncontrollable or uncontainable AI. Uh, and there the real dilemma, and this goes beyond the scope of the book, but, but there is a small section looking at this, that one reason why this sort of fringe discussion about rights for robots and so on, legal personality of AI, one reason to think about giving rights to AI is not because they're enti it's entitled to it at the moment, uh, or that it would necessarily um, solve problems we face at the moment. But because if we ever do get to that point, um, then the question might not be whether we recognize its rights, but whether it recognizes ours. So that, that, that is something that, uh, well, it doesn't actually keep me awake at night, but it, it occasionally uh, sort of filters into my, my dreams. Uh, well, like. that's a, 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 I'm not sure if I should say delightful, but that's a profound place to, to have to bring this conversation to an end. And I think it brings us nicely back, in fact, to Lucy's um, uh, uh, exhibition because a lot of the discussion about AI is not just about AI, it's about us. 
and where and who we want to be. Um, and our relationship with technology is part of that. Um, so thank you so much, Simon, for joining us today to talk about your book. Um, there's actually a host of questions that we didn't get to. I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, it was just a marvellous discussion and, and perhaps um, we'll be able to have Simon back in person before too long and we'll be able to have a We the Robot part two discussion or perhaps Simon there'll be a sequel <laughs> um, which would be wonderful as well so if everybody can join me in thanking Simon in the usual way we do that in zoom which is to write something in the chat clap with your artificial hands or clap with your real hands it's up to you um, we'll allow all options um, but that was just a fantastic presentation and chat and thank you so much for your generous time Simon oh, so I'll do you. the real chat <laughs> thank you. And Lucy as well. That'll do the real chat and other people are doing all sorts of things. So thank you again. Thanks very much, Jeanette. And thanks, Lucy. Thanks, everyone, for great questions and comments. And fingers yep, crossed think... we can all cross paths in person one day. Yeah. And if you look, Simon, I think you need to look at the chat because the pundits and the thank yous are just flowing in. Thank you. Um, so thank you again. All righty. We'll see you at the next session, everybody. Yeah. Bye.